All right, so this is the second class, and I want to talk about low-level coding flaws. Uh, but first, I should probably mention, last time there was quite a bit of kerfluffle about my demonstration of the go-to flaw, so I made another simpler demonstration um, here. So let me just nano it. All right. Uh, this one here, I think, is the one. This one I'm replacing my examples in the text in the uh, lecture with, and I think I'll, I'm planning to also update the uh, quizzes and such to use this example or something close to it. So here's the idea. This is a complete example, so I can run it and make sure everything's correct. Um, so you have an integer called error, and then you print a prompt and read from the user the value of error. And here, if error is one, you print error condition one. If error is two, you print error condition two. And the idea is, if error is 3, you'll print error condition 3. So if you run this, um, and you give it a 1, it says error condition 1. Give it a 2, it says error condition 2. But if you give it a 3, it does not print any error at all. And that's because of the go to fail, which you can see up here. If, if error condition is 2, it'll print this. But then you have this extra go to fail here, which will happen without a condition. This is not included in the if statement. So it will always jump over this code and go down here. So it will never check to see if error condition 3 is happening. And when it reaches the end without detecting an error condition, that is considered to be no error. So uh, signing certificates, uh, digital certificates that would have failed this test end up passing. And that was the, uh, all right. So anyway, I wanted to bring that up and sh show you that. Yeah, hopefully that'll clear it up for anybody who was unclear from last time where I had an inferior attempt to imitate this that uh, had some problems. All right. So low-level coding flaws. We're going to talk about arithmetic vulnerabilities, which are simple, but they do confuse students. If you don't understand binary, uh, it helps to know your binary to see how this works. And I'll have some examples to try to clear it up. Um, but that's the fundamental problem, like an odometer on a car. If a number gets too big, it rolls around and becomes zero again. That's the fundamental problem. You can only fit numbers up to a certain size in computers. And uh, therefore, it's easy to keep adding and adding to a number and then having it turn into a low number suddenly, which is a fault of C. It would not happen in Rust, as we'll talk about. Um, then there's memory management. The main one you see is a buffer overflow, but there are others like a double free and so on, where you lose control of the memory. You make it possible for data input by the user to be put in the wrong part of memory where it shouldn't be and has unexpected effects, letting people take over the machine. And we'll talk about Heartbleed as the example of this flaw. So, the arithmetic vulnerabilities are really just basically numerical. If you have a 16-bit integer, then you have two bytes to store data in. So you have uh, 16 bits. You can They could all be 0, or they could all be 1 for the largest possible number. And that is 65535, because it's 2 to the 16, which would be a 1 over here, and all the rest zeros, minus 1. But all these are 1. So this is the limit of numbers that can be stored in 16 bits, from 0 to 65,000 and change. Now, if you multiply 300 by 300, it's 90,000, so it's too big to fit in. So what happens is the first 65, 535 fits in, and then it rolls over, and you end up with this 24, 464 number. Um, <coughs> that's an integer overflow. And you can see it here. Here's 300 in binary. This is the um, 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2. So this is the number of 4s. And here's the number of 8s, 2 to the 5, and 2 to the 8. So this number is 300. Um, 2 to the 8 is 256, and this adds enough to get you up to 300. So that's 300 as a 16-bit binary number. And if you multiply 300 times 300, you can do it using long arithmetic, same as you would in grade school. The first two numbers are 0, so you move it over two places and put it here. Then you have another one moved over one more, another one moved over two more, and another one, um, and that's it. Uh, yeah, so one, two, three, four. There's four lines here, each set off. And when you add these, you this one rolls over to the 17th place. You have 0 to 15. Uh, so you have 16 places available. The problem is the number is too big. 
so some of that number is over here and gets dropped. So you only get the least significant portion of it, and there's a 2 to the 16 missing. That's the uh, how to see it just by doing long multiplication the way you always have in base 2. All right, so what this means is you can, a lot of things can happen. You can have a buffer overflow because you try to test the input to say it's not bigger than a certain number. And For example, if you want to keep something less than 100 bytes, you'd say if, if the length of this thing is less than 100, then execute it. Well, I can be less than 100 by actually being between 0 and 100, or I can be less than 100 by putting in 65,580 or something, some huge number, which will overflow and then turn into apparently being a number less than 100. And so you might be able to do overflow, uh, you might get wrong comparison, and, or you might end up you know, giving a credit instead of charging for a sale. A number can turn negative. Um, if for signed integers, you can overflow and turn negative. So anyway, that's the problem. You try to compare numbers, but your numbers are in fact misunderstood by the computer because of its limited precision. Uh, this happened to the POWH coin. Now this was a joke put on 4chan a few years ago when cryptocurrency was really hot, but they put it on the real Ethereum blockchain or one of the other blockchains, I think it was Ethereum, and people put money in it, almost a million dollars into it. And the original point was it was supposed to be a Ponzi scheme, so it wasn't going to have any actual financial merit. But they also made a coding error in it, so somebody just stole all the money. And they stole it this way. You were able to trick the contract into subtracting one coin from a wallet containing zero coins. And when you do that, it wraps around to this number, which is 2 to the 256 minus 1, which for all practical purposes is infinity. So somebody was able to start with a wallet with no money and perform a transaction which turned it into a wallet containing all the money, and then they just stole all the money and left. All right, and uh, we, you can do this. We do it in the cryptography class. There's a nice online JavaScript um, environment you can use to perform crypto, uh, cryptocurrency transactions, and it's, you can perform that attack and see how it goes. So, if you want to avoid these things, you got to use an integer large enough to hold the largest allowable value, and then you have to check to make sure that you no invalid values are getting in. So if you're multiplying two 16-bit numbers, the result might take up to 32 bits, or you don't use C. C is the responsible for all this by being too close to machine language. Rust doesn't allow this. If you just have an 8-bit integer and you just keep adding more to it, it will grow until 255, and when you try to make it bigger, instead of rolling around to zero, it will just tell you, attempt to add with overflow. This is why developers love Rust, and there was recently a report by Firefox developers that um, using Rust has cut their development time in half compared to C++ for this reason. It is so much easier to code in a language that doesn't have these booby traps that trick you, but just give you reasonable error messages and tell you, you know, uh, you, if, you, if you do something wrong, it stops and tells you you're wrong so you can fix it instead of just blithely going ahead and having the wrong result leading to a security flaw. So floating point precision also has limitations. Now, floating point is how you handle very large or very small numbers. So you have a number like this, 1.543e23. What that means is 1.543 times 10 to the 23, a one with 23 zeros after it. So that's a really big number. And uh, to completely express that number, you'd need to have 23 digits. But the precision of normal numbers in normal computer languages is not that high. So what happens is you have a sign at the start, plus or minus. Then you have a fraction that's only 15 digits in precision, and then an exponent. So that means um, if you add 0.1 and 0.2, it doesn't exactly give you 0.3. It has an error out here beyond the 15 digits, you know, or somewhere near the 15th digit. These numbers are not perfectly encoded as they're turned into binary. So if you want to solve this, one simple solution for money is don't use fractions, just count pennies. Uh, so it's always integers. Integer arithmetic can be perfect. Um, now another problem is, if you're using floating points, you can't use a condition like x equals y, because the numbers may never exactly equal each other because there's a small errors in them. So you have to use something like this, x greater than y minus a little, or less and less than y plus a little. So there's a little region here of error. And there's a Python function called isClose, just for this reason, to compare some floating point numbers and see if they're close to each other, which means 
equal within uh, the limitations of the precision. All right, and then you can do this in Python, and I might as well do it live. I got my Python right here. If I clear, clear I say, all right, if I'm in Python 3, all right, I can put 100, it'll just print out the number, I can do 100 plus 1 minus 100. Okay, that works. I can do 1e10, 10. 10 to the 10 plus 1 minus 1e10, 1 and that works. But if I try to do 1e20 plus 1 minus 1e20, 1 I get 0 because the precision is enough that when you take 1e20, it only retains 15 digits of precision. When you add 1, it's so small it's lost. And when you subtract this, you end up with the wrong number. So that you can see there, these numbers are not perfect. Decimals in programming is tough. Yes, exactly. And that's why, you know, it's um, the fundamental problem of all these is you have to understand that the, the mathematics you write into a computer program are not treated as ideal perfect mathematics. It's represented with these imperfect representations in binary digits and you you have to understand that there are cases in which you will not get the right answer. Um, so here's integer overflow. Show how easy it is to have this happen. Um, so you have, you're going to use 32-bit integers, which sounds like a lot. It can go all the way up to 4 billion. Then you code time as milli-hours, say, because uh, you might have half an hour, a quarter of an hour or something. This seems a little bit unnecessary, but you could do this, 8,000 for eight hours. Then you have dollar values in cents. So $400 an hour is 40,000 cents an hour. So if you have 40 hours at that rate, then you have 40,000 milli-hours times 40,000 cents, and that's 1.6 billion. So you're almost up to the limit of 4 billion. Therefore, if you had something like overtime pay, you could easily exceed the 32-bit limit. So even though you might not imagine it, this task requires 64-bit integers, not 32-bit integers. It's easier to overflow than you might imagine. Even fairly reasonable numbers can quickly end up being too big. So, um, by the way, a lot of people in C made a big deal out of writing brilliant code, where you just do something like left shift the bits or do an XOR with a binary. So in the binary representation, it will fix the problem. And this is really a bad idea. I used to, when I first started working in finance years ago, I would write tricky code like that. And the boss said, no, 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 never do that. Always do the simplest thing one step at a time and save your partial results in a column so somebody can just put a ruler down and get a calculator and reproduce your calculations. Because you need to be able to prove you're right and you need to create an audit trail that someone can audit. And I had never thought of that because I came from the world of physics where you don't think about things like that. So don't use tricky, smart code. Use simple code that's easy to understand. This helped me when I moved into teaching. Instead of doing it the most clever way, the fastest way, do it in the way that is easiest to understand. <laughs> that will really be best. Um, anything tricky will depend on the exact version of C you're using and the hardware and such. And so even if it works today, when it's used a few years from now on a different machine, it might no longer work because the details of the implementation are different. So be careful using type conversions, like converting from one size to another of integer, or from an unsigned to a signed integer, or a float to an integer. All these things can distort the results. Um, can be, limit the inputs so that you can't possibly um, get the answers that are too big or too small. Use larger size integers, larger size variables. The only thing using larger size variables does is cost a little more memory and a little more time, and most of the time, that's not a big problem. Um, intermediate computed values might overflow even if the final result is within range, and uh, whenever you're in security-sensitive code, you got to be especially careful. Um, all right, and uh, I think I'll play this video at the end. It shows some of this stuff, uh, some more strange things that can happen to you. So let me talk about memory access. Um, so pointers are a very powerful part of C. You can refer to pointers, which are the addresses of data being stored. And a lot of C functions require these pointers, but they are dangerous to handle. So you, if you want to store on the heap, you use the allocate function to allocate 
a pointer pointing to a region on the heap, and then you tell it the size. It allocates that much size on the heap, and free, frees it when you're done, so that memory can be reused for another purpose. So here's correct heap usage. You define a pointer, which will point to an 8-bit integer, I think. Anyway, um, don't quite know what this unsigned int 8 is. I, I think that's a one byte. Oh, it's a pointer. to The data that's going to be stored is unsigned 8-bit integers. That's what this means. But it's going to be a pointer. Then you allocate some space. Then you use it. You put some stuff in P sub 0 and stuff in P sub 99, which is fine. And then when you're done, you free it. This is the correct way to use it. You define the pointer. You don't use it until you allocate space. Then you use it, then you free it when you're done, and then you don't use it anymore. This is what has to happen, and the problem is this has a lot of ways it can go wrong, especially in a big complex program where you have many routines. So it, the code that performs the definition, the allocation, and the freeing might not all be in the same routine and might not always execute in the same order. So uh, if you violate these policies, bad things happen. So you can have a dangling pointer where, for example, you define a pointer, you free it, but you don't set it to zero, so it remains valid, and then later on you write data to that pointer into memory, which is now being used for a different purpose. So now you're changing memory that's, that shouldn't be changed. Um, that's, one, that's a dangling pointer. Um, you can have double free. If you try to free the same thing twice, then the second one performs write operations in the heap which are not using the correct data to write to them. And we use this to take over boxes in the, uh, in the exploit development class. All right, so those are some of the things that can go wrong with these pointers if you don't obey exactly that flow. And then there's the famous buffer overflow, the simplest memory corruption vulnerability, and then the basis of them all. You define a password field with room for 10 bytes, but then you read data from the user, but you don't limit it to only read 10, beta, 10 bytes. So if you put in more than 10 bytes, you can exceed the allowed storage, and now you're writing to memory that has not been reserved for that purpose, and all you have to do is find somewhere to write in memory that is eventually used for the instruction pointer, like the return pointer from a routine, and then you can take over the box. Then there are C structures. You can define these data structures where you can define a structure that has a, a, a Boolean variable, your admin, true or false, then a user ID, then a username, then settings, then user account, and so on. And so since username is here, and username is a pointer, which can point to an array here, if I all I have to do is write to username minus 12 to get back here to is admin, and I can change someone to admin. So this is uh, one of the many kind of flaws that you can have. Then there's leaking memory. Um, if alloc does not initialize memory, this is a fundamental problem in all modern computing. Um, RAM remembers, of course, and when you quit using RAM, the RAM does not know that you're not using it anymore. The same thing is true of a, of a magnetic hard drive, by the way. If you delete a file on the magnetic hard drive, all you do is change some values in something like the master file table, but the blocks containing data are not informed in any way that they're no longer in use. They just The data just sits there even though it's no longer in use and can be recovered by an undelete utility, and you can do the same thing with RAM. If you allocate memory and then write some data in there and then free it, when you free it, you tell the program it's available for reuse, but they do not erase it. There is leftover data sitting in RAM. And if you make some kind of other error, it can leak out. It would be safer to always write zeros to it every time you free it, but that would be seen as a waste of time, and it doesn't happen automatically in C. On SSDs, by the way, this does happen automatically because SSDs cannot write to a block of storage that has not been cleared first. So there is a garbage collection running in the background that finds data that's no longer in use and quietly erases it. But magnetic memory and magnetic hard um, uh, chip memory, which is not exactly magnetic that we use, like RAM, and magnetic hard drives do not have this feature. And so data that is no longer in use is still present and can leak out. All right. 
A string copy and the many related functions are responsible for these buffer overflows in many cases. What it does is it copies a source string into a destination string, and in C, you, the length of a string is determined not by a length number anywhere, but just by a null terminator. You have to have a null byte at the end of a string. So if you copy a long string into a shorter one, it might overflow it. Or if you copy a short string into a longer one, then some of the bytes at the end of that string past the null terminator are leftover data from the past. String n copy tried to fix this problem by letting you limit the number of bytes that are copied, but it didn't ensure that there would be a null terminator at the end. So that means you could have 10 bytes, you could copy 10 bytes into it, but you don't have a null byte, so when you read it, you'll read extra bytes off the end. That might expose data, uninitialized data towards the end. And Heartbleed, this is what happened. Uh, it was the fundamental exposure, uh, most severe Linux vulnerability in decades. This is what really um, changed the attitude of the whole world, which until then had believed Linux is more secure than Windows. And this disaster showed that Linux is susceptible to having huge security disasters just like Windows. They added this thing to the TLS um, specification. For some reason, when you had an HTTPS connection to a server, they didn't want it to time out and hang up. They wanted to have a sort of heartbeat to keep that connection alive. So for some reason, they implemented it like ping, where you can send some data to the server, and the server will just echo the data back to you. You may not know this. Pings can, in fact, carry data. They often don't. But you can send, like, a word to the server, and the server will just echo it back to you. So that's what they did. I'll send the server hello, and the server will sell hello back to me, which is fine. But when they implemented it, they, unfortunately, included a length in here. And the server code at the time did not verify that length. So I would send it a short string like hello, but I would tell it I'm really sending you 16,000 bytes. The server will then just send me 16,000 bytes back, starting with hello and sending me almost 16,000 bytes of uninitialized memory from the server. It, would, it wouldn't clear it first. It wouldn't notice that the actual data that came in wasn't the same equal to the length parameter. It would just send that much data from the stack. And so you could just pump uninitialized RAM off the server, and sooner or later there will be something important in there, like somebody else's password, the master key that the server is using for encryption, or so on. You're just reading random data off the server. And it turned out that when web servers had recently rebooted, in fact, the master key for all their TLS connections was in fact available, and you could break into everything. And it was really very serious. So to remediate that, of course, you just compare the length with the length of the actual data provided, <laughs> and ignore the request. But, you know, nobody did that until the vulnerability became well known and was exploited all over the place, and it was a big scandal, and convinced people that Linux is not so secure at all. Uh, neither Linux nor Windows is secure if you make big mistakes. All right, let's take a look at the Kahoot. And that's this one. Good. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. So how do you reserve memory on the heap?
Yep, you allocate it with M alloc. All right. All right, what's the largest number you can put in a 16-bit unsigned integer? Yep, good. You folks know your 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 binary. All right, what's wrong with this code? It should be coming up here. There we go. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, all right, and uh, let me, uh, I think I can bring it back here. Uh, let's see. Um, let me record these winners and bring it back so we can talk about it. Okay, Zen Hacker. All right. All right. I think I can stop this somewhere. Where is my stop button going to? Is that what this is? Skip animation. All right. Uh, hmm. Not the obvious how to stop. All right. Let me get. Um, let me just go here. Uh, I thought I could see this somehow. Um, this. Oh, there we are. Finally made that code show up. All right. A is 10, B is 20 long, and string copy copies A into B. So this is copying the short one into the long one. That will work. If you copied the long one into the short one, then it would have, uh, you know, be buffer overflow, and it would cause the, might cause the exposure of uninitialized memory. But the way this is now, it works. This is one of the many irritating things about C, it's kind of backwards. It's source destination like this. That's why you get so many. Yeah. This one was reversed on Canvas. Okay, good. I'll check. Thanks. All right. Good. So let me stop this recording.